Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today here at the Iowa Poor Congress. Uh, the title of this session, we're going to talk about PERS 144 V1C, stands for Variant 1C. We've got an excellent lineup of uh, swine uh, PERS specialists, both uh, practitioners and researchers, to talk a little bit more about uh, a virus uh, that um, really started to hit our industry uh, a little bit more than a year ago. And we'll... Uh, I'm sure they're going to give us a little bit update what they're seeing this winter uh, as well, this PERS season. Uh, my name is Chris Rodemaker. I'm a swine extension veterinarian with Iowa State University. I'm at the ISU College of Veterinary Medicine, also uh, an associate director at the Iowa Pork Industry Center. So uh, today we're going to have uh, three speakers. Um, and just due to some logistical uh, challenges, we're going to go ahead and have a couple of them give their presentations by Zoom. And then we'll have one live speaker and then we're gonna do uh, some question and answers at the end. So our first speaker today is Dr. Paul Yeski. Paul is a practitioner with the Swine Vet Center out of uh, St. Peter, Minnesota. And uh, Paul is gonna start out today just to give some experiences with PERS variant 1C. So Paul, I'm gonna let you go ahead and take it away. Well, thanks, Chris. Uh, sorry I couldn't be there in person today, but uh, uh, unfortunately I'm able to give some experiences with this virus. I uh, wish I wasn't able to give this talk, but uh, happy to share what we've uh, learned so far. And again, this isn't for myself, but it's the other veterinarians at the Swine Vet Center and Swine Vet Center Research. So this afternoon, I'm uh, gonna go through quickly uh, the impact of uh, the, the variant 1C <clears throat> in the herd, uh, the clinical science to the industry, uh, some of the clinical signs we saw, some of the clinical impact in the production numbers, we'll go through some, some of those, and then some of the control procedures that uh, we've used and implemented. Uh, I'm gonna use a quote from Dr. Lola. Uh, we know everything about PERS is like, we know everything about the truck that just hit us, we just don't know enough to get off the road. Uh, we know an awful lot of science about the virus. We've done sequencing. We've done whole genome sequencing. Uh, we, we know a lot of the molecular genetics about it, but we still really don't know why it does what it does. I think we've gotten some off-ramps with filtration and with the um, feed-grade mitigants, uh, those sort of things to help us to get off the road a little, little quicker, but still there's plenty to learn about the virus, unfortunately. Uh, if we look at the Morrison Swine Health Monitoring Project, uh, we can see that this year, which starts in the PERS year, starts in July, goes to July. So we can see this year is progressing along uh, like last year, about at the same pace. Uh, we see that tick up in that May timeframe last year, and uh, we'll see what happens this year. I think if we look at the long term picture on the right side there from 2009, uh, the area that's uh, uh, the, the category one, which is the active herds has just continued to get bigger from that time going forward. And uh, the area of the, the category four, the negative herds, the PCR and antibody negative herds uh, being uh, smaller as we go forward. So it still tells us that PERS continuing to be a challenge for the industry. When we look at the swine disease reporting system uh, information, we can see that the uh, L1C, started showing up in 2020 and continued to increase its numbers as we went in, on into 2021. And looking at, again, some of the uh, information back from the Morrison Swine Health Monitoring Project. Again, this is farms reporting incidents. This is both uh, South Farms and Grow Finish sites that are reporting incidents here uh, and just shows the number of sites. And so you can almost you could argue whether there's three waves or four waves that early initial part of 2020 being the first herd seen. Then as it got to late 2020, more herds started showing up on into 21, uh, then died off into the spring. And then about in May, June, uh, peaked out again and then started peaking again in the fall, that November type time frame, and appears to be stabilizing off a little bit here as we uh, continue on through the winter, but a little too early to predict for sure. If we look at the swine disease reporting, again, this is just looking at the, uh, the, the diagnostic lab. So underneath we're looking at herds, here we're looking at diagnostic data. 
And so you can see that the girl finish has had a lot more activity with this particular virus, uh, or at least what's being sequenced. Uh, but there's certainly enough south arms if you look at that area in blue as well and looks very similar to the site map uh, that we see on the uh, on the farms reporting incidents i put this dendrogram in and i apologize that it's small but somewhat by intent you can see all the pink ones are similar viruses within two percent on or5 sequencing in this particular system that was kind of in that uh, uh, right in the center of where all the activity was happening you can see in 2020, uh, 73, almost 74% of the uh, uh, sequences were the same virus, and in 2021, continued to be the same way. When we looked at the clinic dendrogram, uh, a very similar picture. We started out with in 2020, 44% being similar, and in 2021, being up to 64% of the viruses. And so, certainly, uh, something we hadn't seen before with a virus dominating that much of the database. And if we look at the third quarter summary finishing numbers, it'll be interesting to see what fourth quarter is where we should soon see those numbers come up here. But for third quarter, uh, had the highest mortalities across the board, whether we're talking about the highest best performing or the lowest performing herds uh, and the average being highest mortality in the last 10 years. So mortality being up on the grow finish side as well, and certainly maybe tied back to some of this activity. So what did we see for clinical signs? Really nothing that we haven't seen with other PERS viruses before. Um, I would say the biggest difference is just the magnitude. Uh, the off-feed sows would go from uh, maybe five to 10 to 200 uh, overnight. Abortions would go up very dramatically as well. And then we would see the increased piglet mortality following. And then trailing behind that would be the uh, uh, pre-weaning mortality, the mummies and the pre-weaning mortality, and then just seeing slower growth through the lactation period. On the wean to finish side, uh, generally we see the water consumption go down dramatically uh, and uh, see the pigs uh, definitely off feed, pigs being very lethargic. And uh, we had one instance in one of the research barns where we were able to uh, have a, a two week period where we were weighing pens and we even had pig pens that went negative weight gain in that two week period. So certainly uh, takes them off feed and some increased death loss. And that again, very depending upon uh, the flow and the, and the pigs. So what have we done or what have we seen with the virus is uh, the herds do, do stabilize. Uh, it's about two to four uh, kind of tough weeks of production. And then the sows are feeling better and return back to normal. Uh, again, we have seen lower live born just due to the percentage of mummies with this particular virus. Uh, so some herds being affected greater than others, but uh, that's been one of the things that's been a little bit different. How have we handled it as far as managing the virus? Uh, again, we've done the same things we've done with other viruses, the old load, close, homogenize, uh, and uh, go ahead and then use that closure over that 32 week time frame to try and eliminate the virus from the herd and get the field virus from the herds. And uh, for these programs, we've done uh, ongoing monitoring of the clinical signs, the production numbers, the processing fluids and the uh, piglets due to be weaned, uh, blood testing the piglets due to be weaned to have an ongoing monitoring of that status. If we look at some of the production numbers, uh, these farms, these 12 farms all had similar uh, viruses on OR5 sequencing. And so you can see there's definitely differences of magnitude of uh, effect on those herds and uh, certainly different timeframes when those herds had broken. Uh, but um, again, the overall pattern being similar, same thing with the pre-weaning mortality. As we look at that, the overall pattern is similar. Uh, it takes about 16 weeks to return to normal. And uh, you can see there's differences of magnitude depending upon the herd, even though the viruses were all within a couple percent. And when we look at the total pigs wean per sow, the same th sort of thing, you can see that uh, um, that the the magnitudes are different here, uh, but by about 20 weeks returning back to baseline. When we looked at uh, pigs wean per mated female per year, Again, somewhat the same thing. Some herds taking much longer to get back to baseline, others returning in about that 20 to 21 week timeframe. And so again, some of that variation 
um, just like we'd seen on the other charts uh, before. When we took an average and just averaged all that data together, you can see it takes about 16 weeks for the abortions to come all the way back to normal. But after four to five weeks, uh, those are returning back to uh, previous um, break levels. And once we get past that 16 week time frame, actually getting a little lower than where we were going into the break. So again, those return back to normal and total pigs weaned per sow, kind of the same thing uh, as we look at that average dipped off. And uh, really by the time we get to about 20 weeks out, we're returning back to that baseline level. So again, we are seeing those herds come back. I think one of the unique things with this virus is that the um, nursery performance uh, certainly was more severe than what we expected. You can see that kind of uh, gray line down at the bottom being the, the range we had the six months prior to, and you can see we stayed well above that through that time frame. This is a little easier graphic to interpret. Uh, again, pre-break, we were under 2% on the nursery mortality. Until the sow farm uh, got back to baseline, we were up to 31%. Uh, after the sow farm returned to baseline, we were still a uh, double digit mortality. I would tell you that uh, this herd and this flow particularly, uh, the herd, we were able to eliminate the virus and the first group out since then um, has been at 1.2% and they're just ready to top out of a wean to finish barn. So again, it does look like we're returning back to normal, uh, just took a little while to get there. One of the things, uh, to talk about here, anytime we're talking about PERS, we need to talk about bio, biosecurity. Uh, I think we're all used to uh, thinking about biosecurity, but I think most of us are used to thinking about the bioexclusion side, but I wanna also make sure we talk about the biocontainment side. The bioexclusion is how do we keep the virus out of the farm? And this is the one that everybody thinks about and certainly is very important and we certainly wanna focus on but I think we've been a little remiss in the fact that we haven't spent as much time on the biocontainment side, especially in these herds that have turned positive. And it's the forgotten side of biosecurity. Um, how do we keep it on the site? Now we wanna keep the virus from moving through the area, through the countryside. And so the showering out, the handling mortalities and how we're doing those things properly, I think becomes important to us uh, in an area-wide control as well as a farm control picture. So in summary, again, uh, our experience is the virus acts like other PERS viruses. Uh, it does seem to have reduced severity over time. Uh, the early breaks seem to be worse, uh, but that's always uh, never challenged PERS in an open form. Uh, but uh, we'll see We'll see what happens as we go on into the spring this year. Uh, the farms are stabilizing and moving to virus elimina elimination like other uh, PERS viruses. Not every farm has been 100% successful, but we haven't been with other viruses as well, but it does appear to be acting normally. And uh, again, we just want to make sure we have good monitoring as we go forward, and we want to make sure we continue to focus on biosecurity. And for those in the positive areas or positive herds, make sure we do that biocontainment as well. And I'll wait for the questions in the uh, group time. All right, Paul, thank you very much for that really nice overview of what uh, what you guys and your team have saw with this uh, variant in the field. Uh, next up, we're gonna go ahead and have uh, Scott D. Scott, uh, you know, very famous PERS researcher, was a private practitioner, went back to school, got his PhD, uh, was a professor at University of Minnesota, is now a director of Pipestone Applied Research within their group. and. Uh, they took the opportunity because of a lot of the early reports that Paul was talking about. It's like, oh, this virus is so much more severe. It seems to act different. So he and his team, they took the opportunity to do some real basic uh, research just to try to look at uh, answering some of those questions in very applied field settings. Um, so Scott's going to go ahead and share some of that information with you. I'm uh, We're getting getting it pulled up here. So Scott, are you, uh, can you hear us and want to make sure yep. we're all connected? Okay. Yep. We're ready to go. Thanks, Chris. Uh, appreciate the invitation. Uh, I'm sorry. I am also off campus. Obviously I'm in Florida, so I apologize for that. Uh, but I want to thank Dr. Rademacher, also Jamie Eggers for the great job they do on the continuing education side 
And I always like to follow Dr. Yusky because he does such a good job. You know, he's a scientist. He's got a graduate degree, but he's also one of the best field people that I know. He lays it out there real clear and he did it again. So thanks, Paul. I'll, uh, I'll try to follow up along at that level. So as Dr. Rademacher mentioned, this is a uh, project that we did with the help of Beringer Ingelheim Animal Health. And we kind of did it because the world seemed to be in a, a crisis mode. We wanted to learn uh, a little bit more about this virus. So next slide, please, Jamie. Okay. Yeah, so about expo time last year, the, this variant had emerged, kind of like how Paul showed and taking over. And the industry really was in a panic mode. I'd never heard the industry talking in the way it had been. You know, it's like a giving up mode. We're defeatist mode. Nothing works. You know, this is the worst strain ever, people were saying. Vaccines don't work anymore, people were saying. Then biosecurity protocols didn't work anymore. We couldn't keep the virus out of these farms using traditional means. And it was kind of crazy because, yeah, there were some summer infections in regions of low density. And I would, we were worried that people were just giving up. So we wanted to take some action. So next slide, please. So we set up some projects I'll briefly go into, and I'm going to, because of the time, I'm not going to show all the data, but we can certainly talk about it in the discussion. Uh, so first of all, the research questions I identified and, and set up the projects based on was, as mentioned, this is the worst strain of PERS ever. Okay, well, let's take the variant, the 144 variant, and compare it to our standard highly virulent 174 that had kind of been the leader as far as uh, highly pathogenic strains of the virus, let's just compare them side by side in negative pegs, inoculate the pegs and then measure, as you see on the screen, how they do performance wise. Question two is vaccines don't work anymore. Okay, well, let's take some pegs. Let's vaccinate them with either the BI MLV or the uh, Elanco MLV. Let's challenge them, also a control group of non-vaccinated pigs uh, with the variant. Okay, next slide, please. Um, just some details about those two projects. Uh, in our BSL-2 facility, we happen to have four rooms available. So this was basically right in the middle of July. And so we ran this real fast up the, up the flagpole and set this up. We put 90 pigs in a room. We had, we're gonna have 15 cedar pigs that we'd inoculate with the either 144 or 174, and then 75 direct contacts to the uh, get exposed to the virus kind of in a natural way that it would happen in the real world. For the vaccine studies, we use vaccine per label. So we vaccinated at full dose, waited 28 days, and then challenged. And then for our viruses, we selected from a cell farm case of ours that Dr. Joel Neerham actually had overseen a 144L1C variant case. Now we also took our 174 virus that we use for experimental challenge. And these were both from very nice field cases of, of, of the, like just like Paul was saying, really tough reproductive disease. We took the 144L1C variant and to be sure we had the right virus, we sent it to Dr. Ben House at uh, South Dakota State and asked him to do a whole genome sequence and be sure that we had the right virus. We had the variant that Giovanni and others have talked about so nicely. And we found out, yeah, this is the right virus. It's 99.5% similar to the gene bank or the reference virus uh, of the variant. So that was good to know. And then our challenge model, I mentioned is a cedar pig model. We challenged 10% of the pigs intramuscularly and then just let it spread over a 35 day challenge period. Okay, next slide, please. And this uh, credit again to Giovanni Trevison. Um, we wanted to, again, wanted to be sure we had the right virus. And this is his dendrogram looking at OR5 sequences. And you see the black, that's the 144L1Cs. But in that little cluster of red, blue, and green is this variant that they've talked about. So, and, and shown very nicely that it's actually got a, it's a 144, but it's got a piece of the 174 virus mixed in. So it's actually a recombinant. And what you see there in the little green circle, that little green line in the middle, that's our strain. So it fell into this, this little subcluster of the variant, as we've talked about. Very different than the traditional 144. So we, have, we had to be sure we had the right virus. Okay, next please. 
Uh, here are the data from the pathogenicity and vaccine efficacy studies. So here we've got on the left, average daily gain, we've got percent mortality, number of treatment events, and over the, on the top there, you see our different groups. Uh, vaccine A, those are the pigs vaccinated with one of the vaccines. Vaccine B, those are the pigs vaccinated with another of the vaccines. And there's our non-vaccinated challenge group, either 144 challenge or 174 challenge. And so you start to read across the slide and you see some significant differences in vaccinated pigs as far as growth rate versus non-vaccinated pigs. Also, you don't see much difference between the 144 and the 174. Interesting. Mortality, you see the numbers, really not much happening uh, except for that 174 group where we are trending towards significance, although 13% mortality. And there are the numerical data on treatment events in actual injections. Again, this is only a 35-day post-challenge period. That's all the space and time we had. So we can't say this would have you know, uh, continued on the same way for the entire time. So just a little limitation to disclose. Next slide. Uh, viral load. We looked at viral load in these pigs. Uh, boy, there was a lot of virus. You look at day 14 to day 21, just measuring the amount of virus in these pigs. Uh, gosh, but what's interesting, you see, you see a lot less virus in the vaccinated pigs than you do in the non-vaccinated pigs. And you actually see more virus in the 174 in the blood than you do with the 144. So a lot of virus, but some differences being teased out. Okay. And here's a behavior score. This was a neat thing BI brought to the table. Uh, let's measure respiratory rate and behavior uh, each day in the barn and see which, which pigs responded differently. We've got vaccine A and B in blue and orange. And then we've got uh, 144 non-vaccinates in gray and 174 in yellow. So counting all the pigs that were clinically affected, measuring that over time, we see there was a difference in how the vaccinated pigs performed, a much better behavior, much less respiratory disease, much uh, more normal behavior. And then you kind of see how the non-vaccinated pigs in gray and, and yellow, there was a lot more coughing, a lot more dyspnea, a lot more uh, lethargy in those non-vaccinates. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, the next you know, research question was, well, biosecurity protocols don't work anymore. So we ran a bunch of small pilot studies and really wanted to see yes or no, whether the virus was still alive or whether it could be spread or not. And so we looked at feed. Could this virus 144 be spread through feed? Could it be spread by contaminated personnel and fomites? Could it produce infected aerosols? So pigs that were infected with they produce virus positive aerosols. Uh, what about survival and slurry? Was it greater than 14 days, which had been published before? And would it live longer, for example? Would it live out to 21 days? And then transport. Could the feed truck, if, could the feed truck serve as a way to move the virus from farm mm -hmm. to farm? Uh, and also prevention. What about feed mitigants? Did they work? Did Guardian or Cell Curb neutralize the virus? Uh, how about our disinfectants, Ag Forte Pro or Synergize? Would they neutralize the virus? Filters, you know, would Camfil Farmer 14 fiberglass filters stop the aerosol transmission? And then if we took a shower could we and change our clothes, could we stop the mechanical spread? Next slide, please. Okay, so our little feed truck transport model is kind of cute. So we just wanted to see, well, if we have these, let's say we're taking a load of soybean meal from the processing plant and it happens to be contaminated, we take that directly to the mill, we dump it off, we don't clean our truck, we backhaul complete feed. Could that, way, could that be a way the virus is moving from farm to farm? And so we did that with these models. We took soybean meal, we put it in the back of the truck with virus, we emptied it out after an hour, put in complete feed, fed it to pigs as you see, and we did demonstrate uh, transmission of the disease through that route. Next, next please. And then we did collect air, which is showing you the air collector there, the bobcat sampler, the little black box hanging from the filter bank up on top within the room of infected pigs, as well as outside the uh, building after the air had been filtered. Okay, next please. So what we learned from this was, yeah, both of the disinfectants worked, uh, but it took a little while. The, it took 60 minutes of contact with 144 to neutralize the virus, but eventually the products worked. The feed mitigants worked, 
And we showed that without feed mitigants, we could spread the virus through feed. That's something to consider in the way this virus is moving. But if we use a feed mitigant like Guardian or Salcurb in this case, we could reduce that risk. Uh, the feed transport model like with the little trucks that I showed you, the virus survived in that model and we were able to infect pigs. So contaminated soy, contaminated the trailer, which then contaminated the complete feed and the pigs got infected. And survival in slurry was no different than what we'd seen before. Okay, next slide. Finally, if we did take a shower and change our clothes as expected, we could break the cycle of infection from moving from infected pigs to negative pigs. Obviously, if we don't have those biosecurity plans in place, it's very easy to spread the virus from boots and coveralls. But if you if you follow the rules and you take your showers and you change your shoes, uh, you can you can block that spread. Finally, in filters, yes, uh, the air in infected rooms contain virus positive uh, aerosols, but not after filtration. So filtration works. Filtration blocks this virus. Next slide. I think it's the last one, but under the conditions of this study, you know, and, and there are some conditions we have to disclose. This is this is uh, this is a very well controlled study. There are some limitations to it, but in our opinion, the 174 we used was more pathogenic than the 144 L1C variant. And vaccines worked just fine. We found very good efficacy from both of the modified live vaccines. We found that the biosecurity protocols were effective. However, we need to pay attention to aerosols and feed as risk factors. And we'll talk about maybe some of this risk management during the discussion that Dr. Karen Havis from our team has evaluated. So the message I think to everybody is, like Paul said, this is a highly virulent strain of PERS, it's no, but it's really not different than what we've seen in the past. And we have the tools that we can manage this. So we really can't give up. We know what to do. We have to follow the rules. And with that, I'll close and thank again, Chris and Jamie for the invitation and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Scott. Very, very interesting information, a lot packed in there. So like you say, during the Q&A time, we'll be able to, uh, if you have any questions about any of that data or other questions that uh, we think we should be asking, please uh, feel free to do so. At this time, we're going to have Dr. J.Q. Zhang. He's going to be our next presentation. So we had Dr. Yeski kind of give us an overview of what, uh, what he saw in the field. Um, Dr. D shared a little bit of some of the field applied research. Dr. Zhang is a virologist and researcher uh, at the ISU College of Vet Med. He's uh, our primary swine virologist there. And and uh, JQ actually came and, and we'd asked and, and uh, IPPA was kind enough uh, to fund a study. We wanted to have him look at maybe a little bit more at the cellular level to say, well, what's different between this virus and other viruses? So today he's going to share with us some of, his, some of the research that he's been, him and his team have been able to do. Thank you, Chris. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank Chris and Jamie for inviting me to be here to share some experimental data of comparing the pathogenicity and the transmissibility of the recently emergent uh, PERS L1C. I didn't do it. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So as the Dr. Yeske mentioned that um, our PERS variant strain emerged in US since uh, October, 2020. Sequencing indicated that um, these uh, variant viruses uh, formed a separate subcluster within Linju 1C. So most of these variant viruses uh, have the RFP pattern 144. Therefore, we tentatively named this as the 144 Linju 1C variant or Linju 1C variant strain. If you look at this uh, RFP 144 viruses, actually they belong to different lineages and sublineages, and also they underwent the dynamic changes over years. If you just look at uh, year 2020 and 2021, 
for this 144 viruses, they mainly fall within the four types, LINJ1C variant, non-variant, LINJ1C non-variant, LINJ1A, and LINJ1H. These are four of those. So we were able to isolate all of those four. So in this study, we included the four 144 viruses. So then including 144R1C variant, 144R1C non-variant, 144R1A, 144R1H. We also included the one previously characterized the highly virulent 174 ninja one a virus. So totally five viruses. We isolated all of these five viruses in ZMEG cells. And here are the CT values. We also determined the uh, infectious titers in both ZMEG cells and Marco 45 cells. Interestingly, the title obtained in ZMEG cells are higher than the title obtained in Mark 45 cells. So we also determined the whole genome sequence of these five viruses. So compared to this L1C variant, the other four viruses, uh, they all have the less than 90% nucleotide identity at the whole genome level. Um, but today I'm not going to spend time talking about this. So for our experimental design, 72 person naive pigs at three weeks of age were transported to ICU animal facility. We have six rooms. So each room includes the two pens set up like this. So pigs in these two pens can have the nose to nose contact. So at the day zero, then these pigs were four weeks of age. So we inoculated the pigs. So this including eight pigs, so in each of the six rooms, then totally 48 pigs, okay? Initially, the other 24 pigs uh, were housed in the other two rooms to serve as the contact pigs later on. Okay, at the day zero, you can see only eight pigs here. This is the empty. So we give them intramuscular and intranasal inoculation. So totally the six log of the virus per pig. But again, this is the based on the title in the max cells. So then to, roughly between four and five logs if based on the title in Mark 45 cells. So two days uh, after uh, two days of post inoculation, we introduced the four contact pigs to each, you know, pain B in each room. So at the 10 DPI, we utilized the four pigs from the inoculation pen to compare the pathology. The remaining uh, four inoculate pig and the four contact pig were kept through 28 days. So clinical observation. The pigs inoculated with this uh, L1C variant and 174 viruses became more lethargic and uh, were off feed faster than other viruses groups. Here I just show the, some pictures uh, taken at a six DPI. You can see that for the negative control pigs, uh, 144L1H, 144L1A, and uh, 144L1C non-variant, those pigs, both of the pains uh, were pretty active, though not uh, very lethargic. In contrast, in this uh, NINJ1C variant and 174, the pigs were very lethargic, they're depressed, they're piling up just the, under the heat lamp. You know. Mortality. So in this study, all of those pigs that naturally died or were euthanized due to severe body conditions were counted as mortality. So in this L1C variant group, the mortality is six out of eight pigs. In this L1C non-variant, L1A, L1H, L1A, the one out of eight, one out of eight, two out of eight, respectively. Mock inoculate group is zero. So if you look at the body temperatures for those pigs that have the temperature over 40 Celsius degree, we consider that they have fever. Then we calculated the percentage of pigs having fever at each time point in each group. So at uh, one day you know, uh, after inoculation, this L1C variant and uh, 174 group almost have the 100% of pigs with the fever. And then that number dropped at a two, three, starting from the four days, the second surge of the uh, fever came out. So, but uh, between the one and the seven DPI, 
the percentage of pigs have fever was similar between L1C variant group and 174 groups. However, at the day 8, 9, 10, 11, it's a higher percentage of pigs with fever in L1C variant group compared to 174 groups. And this just shows the average temperature, these are real temperatures, you know. Again, between the one and the seven days, um, the average temperature was similar between uh, L1C variant group and 174. However, in 8, 9, 10, those are three days that the higher fever in L1C variant group compared to 174. For ADG, um, based on the minus one to 10 DPI, these are inoculated pigs, eight pigs, you know. So these eight inoculated pigs, um, you can see all of these uh, five of our inoculated group, they have a significantly lower ADG compared to the more inoculated group. Among these five viruses, this L1C variant group uh, has a numerically uh, lower ADG compared to other groups. But these differences were not uh, statistically significant based on the 0 0.05 level. And even in the contact peaks, uh, this L1C variant and 174, they have a numerically uh, lower ADG compared to other groups. For the viremia level in inoculated peaks, um, so at uh, one, uh, two days DPI, there's a significantly higher viremia level in L1C variant group compared to the other four viruses. 174 group is, uh, you know, in the middle. And we also tested the viral load in oral fluid. Similarly, at the two DPI, there's a higher uh, virus load in oral fluid of the L1C variant group compared to other groups. You may notice that uh, uh, we missed some time point because at some time point, uh, we were not able to, to collect oral fluid because the pigs were sick, were not, not interested in chewing roots. And then we uh, utilized the four pigs at the 10 DPI. Um, we checked for the lung growth lesions. So, you know, for this whole lung, so we one pathologist checked what the percentage of these lung tissues have the growth lesions. Then he calculated this percentage, you know. So you can see that R1C variant and 174, they have a significantly higher percentage of lungs having the lesions compared to the, the other three groups. So they also pathology can tell you if this gross lesion is due to a, a virus or due to bacteria. If a bacteria, there's some con consolidation, but all of these groups, uh, that percentage due to bacteria, uh, that no difference, no significant difference. And then here is uh, microscopic lung lesions in, in a clay pig that the 10 DPI, that the numerical higher uh, scores in L1C variant group compared to others, similar thing for the IHC scores. Uh, I do not have time to present data in the contact pigs, but just, just to show this one slide, this viremia in contact pigs, you can see that at uh, four DPI, that means the two days post uh, contact, because we put the contact pigs there, the two DPI. So two days after the contact, um, Four out of four pigs in this L1C variant group uh, has this um, uh, became viremic, but in other group, either two out of four or zero out of four became viremic for these contact pigs. So this implies that uh, this L1C variant group, well, this virus may have the potential higher transmissibility compared to others. So the conclusion. The findings from this experimental study basically align with the field observations presented by Dr. Yeski. Uh, this L1C variant in our clade pig had more severe outcomes in some aspects, uh, example, the fever, the viremia levels. Also, the number of the contact pigs become viremic at the two days post contact uh, implies that this variant strain may have the potential, you know, higher transmissibility. However, this needed to be further confirmed with a study involving more pigs. Uh, as you know, Dr. Yesik and uh, Dr. Scotty mentioned that uh, we needed to continue to monitor this L1C variant group and take appropriate control strategies. Uh, next, we are in the process of you know, comparing these commercial parts of vaccines about their protection 
efficacy against this L1C variant strain. Dr. Scotty already presented some data. We are comparing the six vaccines against this virus. So this uh, study involved lots of people, and uh, this was funded by IPPA and uh, Dr. Chris Rainmaker. Thank you. Okay. All right, very good. So thank you very much, JQ, Scott, Paul. Much appreciated for three really excellent presentations. Uh, very different, but really kind of flowed together very, very nicely. So uh, now really is the opportunity for, for you guys as the audience members to take the opportunity to ask our panelists any questions, if you guys have any. Okay, got one over there in the front. So if you would just please uh, state your question and then uh, state who you want to answer the question. And it's okay if you say all or any. Uh, this question is for uh, Dr. Yansky. Uh, it seems to seems like uh, the pig's response to this one four four one C virus, the response are variable, right? You know, you compare to different farms actually have a pretty different outcomes when they get this virus, and what factors are contributing to those variations. Oh, Paul, we're gonna to have to have you on mute real quick. No problem. It's a true Zoom call. <laughs> you have to have to go through that. But um, <clears throat> the uh, uh, one of the differences out there were some of these herds were vaccinated. Some herds would have had previous exposure, uh, but we did have some herds that were uh, category four that didn't have a severe of uh, clinical signs either. So it does appear that there are herd differences. Uh, even though there may be differences in immune status as well. So uh, there's all those things playing into the differences we saw in the outcomes there. Paul, maybe a follow-up to that. Did you find any of those factors that were more protective or ones that would explain why some of those farms bounced back a little bit quicker than some of the other sow farms? Yeah, not not specifically. I, I, I would say it's still somewhat of a little bit of a mystery, just like okay. PERS is, uh, but uh, not a good reason there that the one thing that I would say is different is the course and time. Uh, the most severe outbreaks were the ones that happened in the fall of uh, 2020 and the ones that happened more like into June of uh, 2021 seemed to be a little less severe. Um, so it does appear that there was a little bit of change there over time or it might just be the herds too. It's There's not enough herds there really to talk about to be honest. Okay, excellent. Other questions from the group? Yep, we got one right there. If you want to just give us a second so we can get the microphone over to you. Yeah, we broke with the 184 strain last summer, and it's been ugly. But what would be your ideal protocol for incoming wean pigs going into a finisher when you know that you have that virus active in the sow herd and it's only a matter of time before the pigs get it. Um, and it seems to me that the worst time for those pigs is probably 14 to 18 days post weaning when we started to see the good looking pigs going backwards and uh, just got worse from there. So what's What's your incoming protocols? Yeah, I think it's a it's a very good question, um, and I, I think it's one of those that's uh, difficult in the uh, particularly as you go through and you have to understand that it's a progression through time. And as you start out from the outbreak, the pigs will tend to break earlier in the nursery phase. As you get further into the outbreak and the herd begins to stabilize, then we see the pigs breaking later in the nursery phase. So. It's somewhat of a continuation over time, but I think anything we can do to help make those pigs feel more comfortable, uh, taking a look at your set points, probably running those a little bit higher than you typically would be, you know, anywhere from a couple to four degrees higher, let the pigs tell you what the right temperature is, uh, making sure those pigs get started on feed right away, uh, you know, using gruel bowls, uh, mat feeding, all those tricks out there to help get the pigs eating and consuming, get them on a positive weight gain as soon as possible. And then, uh, you know, certainly using antibiotics to help uh, 
uh, with the secondary vaccinations. Again, they're not going to help us with the PERS, but they're going to help with the secondaries and just be ready. Uh, each herd is going to be a little different on what their secondary profile is going to look like. And so uh, working with that and then just adapting with the pigs as they go through, once they start to show you clinical signs, again, you can't stay on the normal curve for ventilation and temperatures. You're probably going to have to warm them back up and make the pigs feel more comfortable, spend that time in that individual pig care. We've seen that really make a tremendous difference, but uh, understand that. Uh, None of these pigs are fun to raise, and they're they're a lot of work uh, through that time frame. Yeah, some great feedback there. Oh, hold hold on. All right. So, what's your preferred antibiotic once you start seeing the pigs thumping, hearing them cough, snotty noses, swollen joints? Yeah, again, I would defer back to your veterinarian just to uh, make sure, because every herd profile is a little different, and I uh, just want to make sure that uh, we don't uh, uh, step out of bounds there. But uh, again, some sort of uh, broad spectrum antibiotic. Um, uh, you know, some of the products uh, also have some anti inflammatory activity. Uh, those I think are helpful too. Uh, you know, I think there's a, a wide variety of products that are, are good ones out there and uh, probably best to work with your uh, local herd vet to, to pick the best one for you. All right, other questions for our panelists? Yeah, one right there. Hello, um, that, that will be for anyone. Okay. What would be the main thing to decide if, if you wanna maintain your farm, your herd farm, stabilized or become negative and if you are thinking on becoming negative what's the average time that you have on on the farms and so for the second question do you mean how long it takes to get them to negative yeah okay okay all right paul I'll let you probably take that one okay sounds good um yeah, the decision on whether to keep the uh, the field strain in the herd or not is uh, that depends upon producers and a little bit their goals. But uh, um, kind of my bias, uh, and I think you know that Chris is my bias is to get rid of the field strain as as quickly as we can, so that we don't have to continue to deal with it. And then uh, if we want to have ongoing protection, to use something like uh, the vaccine as an ongoing protection uh, for the herd, if we want to have some sort of ongoing herd immunity. And so, uh, our goal has been to get the field virus out of the herd as relatively quickly as we can, and then, uh, get back to what we'd perceive as more negative flow or negative pigs coming through the system. And what we've seen is, um, the early herds, we are able to get herds to come negative in that 32 week time frame, like we have with other viruses, uh, doing the load. Uh, close and expose and then lock down for that 32 weeks. Um, and we've seen some herds not behave, uh, but I've seen that with other viruses too. So I, I don't think it's really necessarily higher than what we've seen with other, other viruses, um, that some herds come through faster than others, but uh, we've been able to see them make it in that 32 week time frame. And uh, like you saw in that data, we had some very high Wean to finish mortality or nursery mortality numbers. But once we got to negative pigs, they returned to where they were previous, or actually a little bit better than where we were previous to the outbreak. That answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, you bet. Good question. Yeah, that was going to be one of mine too, Paul. Is did you guys find anything different on your load close exposed compared to? protocols in the past, anything that we guys did differently that you found was more successful or less successful than in the past? I'd say it's not really different. I think um, uh, the, the severity and the magnitude of some of those early herds uh, had people very attuned to uh, making sure they followed the rules. And uh, I think that might've helped the procedures a little bit as uh, everybody didn't wanna go back there again. So they were paying attention to the details. Yep. Other questions? Uh, 
another question for Dr. Yansky. You talked about a biocontainment, right? Uh, I think that's a very interesting concept. Uh, there, are, you know, people, you know, uh, shower out, those are very important, but uh, what about the, you know, uh, testing the, the finishing pigs, uh, make sure the, the, the finishing pig we're sending to the slaughter plant are, are, are disease free and, or they're not carrying disease. Cause I think they're, you know, some of the system in Canada, they're doing this for, for PDV uh, type of viruses. Yeah, I think the, the biocontainment, like I say, is kind of the forgotten piece of biosecurity. And uh, uh, we did some outbreak investigations and it kind of brought it back to uh, my attention. And uh, one of those things that I'd probably forgotten about as well as others. And so uh, I do think it is good for us to all go in and review. If we have positive sites, you gotta make sure we try and keep the virus uh, on the farm and contain it there. And so certainly, uh, monitoring finishing sites, I think, uh, is, a, is a good thing. It becomes a little bit more complicated when sites are vaccinated, uh, but uh, still can be done with some of the differential PCRs and some of the clamp technology on sequencing. And so I think understanding what's in the local area is very important. I think uh, as we get a better handle on that, that's going to help us in uh, these area and regional control projects and understanding what's going on there. But uh, certainly I think having a better feel for that is important as well as uh, just making sure uh, we continue to be good neighbors and that we're not uh, perpetuating that virus out into the community. Uh, when we leave the farm, hopefully we're leaving the virus on the farm and how we handle our mortalities and that sort of stuff too, making sure we're careful uh, with that as well. Any other questions? All right, I've got one real quick one for JQ. JQ, I found it very interesting that with the variant 1C was able to achieve very high viral titers very quickly. Why do you, th do you have any reasons to speculate why that might be for this strain? Yeah, that's a good question. Short answer, we do not know. <laughs> <laughs> Short answer, we don't know, yeah, right. Yeah, but I think, um, you know, 174 then they emerged in 2014, 2015, then has been, you know, based on the field observation and also experimental inoculation, we already know that uh, it's um, highly virulent. So after that, you know, people ever sequenced that uh, for the whole genome sequencing compared that to other strains. Uh, so they have the deletions in NSP2 uh, region. And so now we determine this uh, whole genome sequence of 144. And uh, they also have the similar, you know, deletion pattern mm. in SP2, mm. but it's uh, still just uh, too early to see which part of the genome, you know, contributed to that high virulence. But based on the experimental uh, study we have done, we feel pretty confident to say that this L1C variant is truly a high virulence strain, although we do not know the mechanism okay. yet. Okay. Okay. Very good. And Any Chris, class? oh, go ahead. Chris. Yeah, I'd just like to say, I think uh, for all producers out there, uh, really nobody wants any purse strain. Um, none of them are good. And so we know there's lots of different strains out there and uh, certainly uh, certainly none of them are friendly to, friendly to the farm. Yep. Yeah, it just seems like we do a better and better job of selecting for strains that are meaner and more virulent and <laughs> grow faster and to higher titers as well. So I really appreciate, uh, you know, a very unique uh, perspective of all three of you really, and really want to take the opportunity if there's any last questions. Otherwise, I would just ask the audience here to help me in thanking our three speakers today. Mm -hmm.